When our, our son Robin was a toddler, he was obsessed with big machinery, tractors and trucks. And we lived in rural Oregon, and there were a lot of loggers going by and farmers. And every time he'd see one, he would say, tractor on, if it was running. And if it wasn't running, he'd stop or idle or park. He would say, tractor not on. So everywhere we went, tractor on, tractor not on, would drive us crazy. Well, one day Nancy decided to take the kids to a department store. We had to travel to another town. Rob had never been to one before. And the whole way there, tractor on, tractor on, tractor not on. They were so glad to pull into that parking lot. They get out of the store. And they walk into the store, go up the stairs to the clothing department, and there was a mannequin. Robin pointed to it and said, person not on. <laughs> if you look up the word perfect, one of its meanings is to be without blemish. And that's usually how I think of the term. And I grew up being taught that Jesus was that kind of perfect. Humans could never be like Jesus. Blemish, free, perfect. But actually, Jesus is supposed to be fully human. Fully human. And how could a being without blemish be fully human? A human without blemish would seem to be, to borrow my son's phrase, a person not on. A person not fully human. To be Fully human is to err along the way, if not in the eyes of oneself, then at least in the eyes of the world. And sure enough, despite what I was taught, and probably all of you were taught, the Bible reports Jesus had what many in the world would call blemishes. Things like the reports in John and in Mark that Jesus' family and others thought he was insane. Or Jesus reported reputa reputation of being a glutton and a drunk, or all those ne'er-do-wells Jesus hung around with, the prostitutes and lepers, tax collectors, Samaritan, homeless people, and criminals. And Jesus, our sovereign himself, was, as the story makes clear, a criminal. And today, any one of the flaws that I just mentioned would keep the tabloids busy about Jesus for years. And they ought to be enough to satisfy any skeptic that Jesus was far from being a person not on. Jesus was clearly on, living life fully, with critics pointing out perceived blemishes. And so make no mistake about it, at that horrible place of crucifixion 2,000 years ago, there were real, fully human beings on those crosses feeling pain. Dying. All three were criminals. And those criminals might be the most famous in history. And we don't tend to think or consider Jesus that way, or for that matter, other Bible heroes as criminals, but a lot of them committed what the world did or does call crimes. In the Old Testament, Abraham abandons his wife and son Ishmael in a deadly desert. And later appears to plan to kill his other son, Isaac. And Jacob fraudulently deceived his father and mother. And the founders of the tribes of Israel beat their brother Joseph, planned to murder him, sold him into slavery, and covered up their crimes. Joseph bears false witness against Benjamin and falsely imprisoned. And the midwives, Shipra and Pua, and Moses' mother and Pharaoh's daughter, all disobey edicts of Pharaoh. Moses murdered an Egyptian. Esther trespassed the king's chamber and practiced an illegal religion. Samson committed arson and assault and battery and mass murder. David committed adultery and premeditated murder. And Solomon enslaved thousands and even threatened to cut a living baby in half. In the New Testament, the Magi disobeyed the edict of Herod. Mary's pregnant outside of betrothal. It's a capital offense. John the Baptist seditiously challenged the authority of Rome and instigated others to do so too. Peter sliced off the ear of an officer. 
Paul was convicted, jailed, and executed. All these folks I've listed, these chosen by God Bible heroes, all committed criminal acts. And one sort of has to conclude that while we may have trouble seeing good in those who commit crimes, God does not have trouble finding their value, even their perfection or task at hand. Which brings us back to the criminals in today's story. Those criminals are called rebels in the gospel. The rebel label fits with what we know about Roman history. Lower class people convicted of sedition, that is, rebellion, were the only ones crucified by Rome. We know that as a matter of history. The two criminals crucified with Jesus were likely rebels caught trying to bring about peace to Palestine through violent means against Rome, attacking its people and its properties. Palestine was rife with the violence of insurgents against Rome. And the surly criminal in the story is like the supposedly faceless criminals in our culture that we tend to love. Luke notes his mean disposition as he derides Jesus. Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. He's like the devil at the beginning of Luke who tells Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. Angels will protect you. The first criminal has no chance in the story of winning us over. Like the portrait of criminals in our media, he does not appear to be like us. He's devil-like. We don't want to be like him. We don't care about him. But the second criminal Oh man, he is so like what we want to be in his situation. He tells the bad guy to leave Jesus alone. He admits his crimes. He sees Jesus as having done nothing wrong and asks only to be remembered. The good criminal. What a guy. The criminal or not, we feel we know him. We care about him. We want to save him. And Jesus does just that. Truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise, he says. And we've been raised to want to be like the good criminal, flawed and blemished, but remorseful. You know, the criminals on the cross, at best, we seem to set our aim to be like him. But there's another choice, a much harder choice. Not the nice guy on the cross, certainly not the surly guy, rather the third criminal on the cross. That extraordinary, fully human being Jesus. Jesus was tried and convicted and sentenced and punished by law. We may not want to hear it, we may not like it, but Jesus died a criminal in his day. It is scandalous still. Like the two men reported to be out there on the crosses with him, Jesus was a rebel. There is no getting around it. Rome only crucified those found guilty of rebellion. The gospel authors spin the story to suggest Jesus was framed, but scholars are convinced that Jesus committed crimes. Indeed, the, the gospels suggest Jesus broke a number of laws. But they also make a strong case that Jesus' crimes were done with divine purpose. John Deere, in his book, The Sacrament of Civil Disobedience, puts it like this. Jesus was a peacemaker who time and time again broke the laws that oppressed people and kept them like slaves to injustice. Jesus was not just provocative. His actions were illegal, civilly disobedient, and divinely obedient. And Mahatma Gandhi wrote that Jesus was the most active resistor known perhaps to history. This was non-violent par excellence. According to Luke 4, Jesus begins his ministry by reading these words from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And with these words, Jesus provocatively began his revolution of love in the Roman Empire. And those were the days of free speech. And challenges to Rome brought trouble and troops and brutal 
brutal violence. And it's no wonder that the people of Nazareth in that story throw Jesus out and almost off a cliff when they heard him deliver that first talk of revolution. They had to be afraid that Rome would come crushing down on them, which was how Rome crushed rebellion. After Jesus' first revolutionary sermon, he then starts acts to bring about his revolution. God's call for love and justice and peace for absolutely everyone. And as a, a part of his action, he broke laws. He touched lepers and broke the laws of cleanliness. He unlawfully plucks grain and heals on the Sabbath. He heals a possessed man and causes the drowning of a herd of pigs and is once again chased out of town. And Jesus challenges the temple, the go-between for God. He calls folks to God through meals where all are invited, all are equal. He calls folks to God through the caring treatment of all neighbors, all neighbors, even enemies. Jesus' message is you don't have to get to God the Roman control temple. You can get to God through love. Love of God, love of self, love of others. And the temple was the center of Rome's corruption of Judaism. Jews, the vast majority of whom were extremely poor, had to visit the temple and exchange for a fee coins bearing graven images for coins that were suitable for offering. The temple claimed a monopoly on mediating God and Rome and its elite profited by it. Jesus enters the temple and in a public act of civil disobedience turned over the money changing tables and blocked access to the temple. And even today we call this a pretty serious act of criminal trespass and mischief. If we read about such conduct in a place of worship in the Mount Vernon News, we'd expect the perpetrator to be fully prosecuted and punished. But 2,000 years after Jesus committed his crimes, we look at what Rome considered criminal conduct, high treason and insurrection, and we don't see them as blemishes, but signs of God, signs of perfection. Jesus' nonviolent acts to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor are laudable. They are exemplary. They are graceful. They are heroic and they are godly. In a word, they are perfect. In addition to meaning blemish free, the word perfection also means lacking nothing essential to the whole, thoroughly skilled in a certain field and completely suited for a particular purpose. Those three definitions describe Jesus to a T. He lacked nothing. He was as skilled as you could hope to be, and he was completely suited for the purpose of bringing about God's shalom through nonviolence and love, not just in his generation, but for all generations to come. Jesus' understanding, experiences, and connections with God and his acts on earth are so amazing and so powerful that he not only shook his world, he continues to shake the world and has so ever since. You can feel the vibrations in the gospel stories. You can hear it in his voice in today's story. There on the cross, tortured and dying, fully human, Jesus' words are full of love. Father, Forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Fully human, Jesus nonetheless magnified God. Magnified God within his very being. Jesus was a person so much on in his living and in his dying that he created what theologian John Cobb calls a field of force that continues to exist today. Stepping into Jesus' field, we can find a path to the sacred. To God. The Gospels call it the way. Jesus opened a way, a, a portal, if you will, through which God can be and is experienced. That's amazing. And it is certainly good news. But that good news has some tough, tough 
edges to it. As Christians, we are called not just to step into Jesus' field of force and bask in its beauty, but to actually try to be like Jesus. First, John puts it like this, whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk just as he walked. And we may not ever be able to walk exactly as Jesus walked, but every step in that direction literally makes a world of difference. It changes the world and it brings about God's way of peace and justice that much closer. Gandhi and Reverend King walked many a non-violent step like Jesus did and each had criminal arrest records. And look how powerful their lives were. Those criminal legacies continue on decades after they passed away. They changed our world in our generation. We don't have to be arrested to walk like Jesus. The Amish who acted so forgivingly a few years ago when their school children were attacked certainly walk like Jesus had did Mother Teresa and St. Francis and countless other saints who have lived in obscurity, many without arrest, but they loved others. And they loved God. And we too can take small steps and have powerful effects. And the saints whose names we will read today and others in our lives that we will soon light a candle for are proof of this. Each one of them in their turn acted in kindness, cared for others, and had powerful effects in the lives of others, touching them even still, even now, by their love and compassion and care. That's walking Jesus way. Proverbs tells us that the memory of a good person is a blessing. A blessing. And it's a blessing because that life continues to have positive meaning, to vibrate with love throughout time. And our life may not create a field of force like Jesus did, but every step that we take toward his way, toward love, can also change the world, can bring God shalom, Christ's reign of love and peace for all creation that much closer. We don't need to be without blemish. All we need to be is a person on, a one who acts with love. We can be like Jesus, even if only for a moment. What a difference. Christians, Jesus, Jesus, a man others saw as a criminal, began that difference in a world-altering way some 2,000 years ago by living life fully human, fully on, full of God.